thank you for the word that you have for us today and the chance we have to dig into um, the scriptures that you've given us. So we just pray that you help us to focus and to um, glean something from it as um, Martin comes this morning. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. try to have, at least for myself, a sermon title. I didn't have one until about 30 minutes ago when Starla started talking. Uh oh. <laughs> Am I in trouble? <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. I think if I were to, to, to title this message, it would be our legacy. It would be our legacy, um, as shown by Paul. Um, legacy for us individually, but also for us collectively. Somewhere in here I have my sermon. There we go. You know, the last, gosh, it, how long have we been in Romans now? Forever. <laughs> Seems like a couple of months, because it probably is. Forever. Uh, I have notes from Romans in November. Before I was there. <laughs> I came back here in like chapter six. <laughs> yeah, so it's been a while. Um, Romans has been so, so deep. Uh, and I don't know about you guys, but I've thoroughly enjoyed digging deep into to this book that really uh, provides some foundational thoughts on what we're to, to believe and do. Rod will be finishing up over the next couple of weeks, chapter 16, as that's some final um, greetings from Paul, some final warnings, um, kind of wrapping it all up. Um, but I get the pleasure of wrapping up chapter 15 today. Um, where Paul talks about his legacy, where Paul guides us in his legacy and our legacy. And so um, we're just going to jump right in. We're going to read, then I'll pray, and then we'll dig into it. Um, we're going to start um, on verse 20. I know we read that last week, but we're going to we're going to add it to our group uh, to our uh, section this week. So. Um, Romans chapter 15, starting in verse 20. My aim is to preach the gospel where Christ has not been named, so that I will not build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who were told about him will see, and those who have not heard will understand. That is why I have been prevented many times from coming to you. But now I no longer have any work to do in these regions. I have strongly desired for many years to come to you, whenever I travel to Spain. For I hope to see you when I pass through and be assisted by you for my journey there, once I have first enjoyed your company for a while. Right now I'm traveling, traveling to Jerusalem to serve the saints, because Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Yes, they were pleased and indeed are indebted to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual benefits, then they are obligated to minister to them in material needs. So when I have finished this and safely delivered the funds to them, I will visit you on the way to Spain. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, through our Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in fervent prayers to God on my behalf. Pray that I may be rescued from the unbelievers in Judea, that my ministry to Jerusalem will be acceptable to the saints, and that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed together with you. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for um, all of this time that we've had in the book of Romans. Thank you for the examples that we've seen, the, the uh, just the building up of, of our faith and 
our understanding of you. Lord, we'd ask that you would continue to do that. Lord, as we dig into this passage of Scripture this morning, I'd ask, get me out of the way. Lord, let this be a message from you. Let this be your words, not mine. And then, Lord, as we um, finish up our time together this morning, give us the courage and boldness, like Paul, to preach the gospel where Christ has not been named where we could go and preach the gospel around the world, starting right here. So Lord, just guide us, direct us, strengthen us, and send us out. It's in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. So really, um, as I dug into this, there were really two things that, that I kind of saw that that just really jumped out to me, um, that we need to evangelize around the world, here locally and around the world, and that we as a church, that supporting evangelism should be our priority. Evangelism and supporting it should be our priorities. And if those are not our priorities, then we need to check ourselves. That we need to do some serious um, prayer, some serious heart searching, some serious digging into our lives to see if we're really doing what we're called to do to leave our legacy. Because our legacy needs to be more than just having a bunch of people at our church, or at, at, not at our church, at our funerals. But how many people have we impacted through our lives? I see that here, right? And, and some of the stuff that we're going to talk about today, you, you, you've all heard it. I know you have. But as I was digging through this, I, I needed to be reminded of it. And so all I could feel is, God, if you're leading me down this path, somebody other than myself needs to be reminded of this. When I say we're called to reach around the world, none of us really are all that surprised by it. I mean, we got Acts 1 8 that says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We, we get it. Right? We've heard that over and over again that, that we need to reach around the world. Jesus said, again in Matthew 28 19 and 20, we can probably all put this together, I'm sure. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Not some nations, not the nations that just look like us, but all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to, serve, to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And as I read verses 20 through 21 from chapter 15, my aim is to preach the gospel where Christ has not been named, so that I will not build on someone else's foundation, but as it is written, those who were not told about him will see, and those who have not heard will understand. Over and over, we're reminded to go to the ends of the earth, to preach the gospel, to evangelize everyone. And that's us individually and us collectively as a church. You know, as I was digging into to all of this, I, I was um, looking at some maps, and I almost included them this morning, of where Paul's missionary journey, um, missionary journeys have taken him. And, and when he says, um, here, I've been prevented many times from coming to you, but I no longer have any work to do in these regions, he hit all of that area that was east of Rome. He evangelized all of that, and now he, he didn't have anywhere else to go there. And so he wanted to go somewhere where people have not heard about Christ. He didn't want to repeat or build on anybody else. So that leads to the question, should we build on what other people do? I don't know that I can answer that question. I am not Paul. And no offense, neither are any of you. You might be called to go to places that have not been reached 
you might be called to stay here physically. But here's the thing, we are all called to be witnesses. And I love what my notes say, I'm gonna brag on myself, we're called to be witnesses here, there, and everywhere. There's a reason I like the last song that we're gonna sing today. Because everywhere we go, we're called to be witnesses. Everywhere. Now, I want you to just think about that for a moment. I'm going to reread Acts 1 9 for a second. I'm going to change some emphasis for you. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus did not say, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem or Judea or Samaria or to the ends of the earth. He said, you will be witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. We are called to be witnesses at all of those things. We are called to be witnesses at all of those things. That does not mean, however, that all of us are necessarily called to go to all of those places. Because there are still people in Pike County that don't know Jesus and we're called to reach them. But if our focus is just on Pike County, then there's a problem. There's a major problem. Because we're called to reach and, 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 and. If you take a map or a globe and you spin it, Anywhere you touch your finger and stop it, we're called to reach that spot. Not sure about Antarctica. But everywhere else. But there are people in Antarctica who need to hear the gospel. And so, somebody that likes cold way more than I am, than I do, is going to have to go down there. And Maddie, you will not be able to wear those shoes if you go to proclaim the gospel <laughs> in Antarctica. Just saying. <laughs> so here's the thing as I was digging into this just the reminder over and over and over again how we are called to witness and then I was reminded of Secret Church <coughs> excuse me Secret Church this past year was all about the great imbalance how we've spent um, so little of our international missions funds how little of our people go to reach the unreached. Less than 1% of our funds for international missions go to reach the unreached, but less than 3% of our missionaries. This is something that we must consider. This is something that we must be praying about because we're called to be missionaries, to witness everywhere. And as I, I you know, we, we've been hearing over and over and over again recently about Afghanistan and um, how the, the, there's challenges there. And yet, we focus so much of our international missions money on places that have already been reached. I dug in a little different, a little deeper. And, and some of you probably already know this, but it was just a great reminder for me. Something called the 1040 window. Uh, the 1040 window is located from 10 degrees south to 40 degrees north of the equator. I almost did that backwards. Um, in, in that region, it stretches from northern Africa through the Middle East and Central Asia into Southeast Asia. Okay, so Afghanistan doesn't fall in that region, but um, a lot of other people do. In fact, two-thirds of the world's population live in the 1040 window. That's most of the globe's population is in that small little window. And 95% of those people have never heard the gospel. They don't know Jesus Christ. They don't have opportunities. 87% of the poorest of the poor are living on an annual average, annual, of $250 per family. I'm going to tell you, 
I spent pretty close to that on food for a weekend with nine, kill, nine kids in my house. And these 87% of them are living on that for a year. We are truly blessed. And maybe we need to shift our focus some. See, in many of those nations in that 1040 window, the gospel is illegal, and belief in Jesus Christ will result in imprisonment or death. But I don't read in Acts 1.8 where it says, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Samaria and Judea to the ends of the earth where it's easy. think there's any caveats to our witness. We're called to witness. I mean, let's just be realistic. Sometimes it's just as scary going into a bar in Pike County and proclaiming Christ to your friends. Or dare I say, walking into the halls of Clopton High School or Bowling Green High School and declaring Christ and proclaiming Christ in the classrooms as it is in Afghanistan. Now likely, we're not going to be shot, but we're still going to face persecution potential. And we're called still to do that. So I'm asking you to think about, are you witnessing? Are you witnessing? And I'm not talking about us as a church. We'll get to that. But I want you to look deep inside yourself and ask the question, am I witnessing? And I'm not suggesting that, that we only um, witness in that 1040 window. I'm saying, are we witnessing? Are you standing firm on your faith? Right here in Pike County. Because I can tell you, if you're not standing firm on your faith right here in Pike County and witnessing, chances are you're probably not witnessing in that 1040 window either. And I don't just, I'm not just pointing fingers at all of you, I'm pointing fingers at myself. Am I witnessing as much as I should? Because I also don't read in here, uh, you will be my, my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth when it's easy for you, but when it fits your time. I mean, we look at what Paul has gone through. I was reading in, in 2 Corinthians this morning, my, my quiet time, where Paul was talking about the number of times that he was, uh, and, and those of you that are following in the reading plan will read this later today, or if you haven't read it yet, but he was beaten, he was uh, whipped like multiple times to an inch of his life, he was stoned, he was shipwrecked, he was all of these things. He didn't go and do this when it was convenient, easy, and safe for him. We need to be witnessing. And, and here's the other thing. Uh, it's not just about the, the paid leaders. It's not just about the, the leadership in churches that are called to witness. We are all called to be witnesses. Too often, I think, not us, but many churches are like, Pastor, I pay you to go do the witnessing. Oh, missionaries, I pay you to go do the witnessing. You handle that. We're all called. To go do that. Colossians 4 verses 5 and 6. Paul wrote, walk in wisdom. It's Colossians 4 verses 5 and 6. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. This is us being called individually to witness. We are all called We're all called to witness and share our faith to everyone outside of 
these walls. You need your family. You need your friends. You need your co-workers. You need some people you're standing behind in Walmart. You need some people who are bringing you food when you sit in a restaurant. You need your students. Your staff. Everyone. That letter to the church in Galatasaray was addressed to the church, not to the church leaders, the individuals of the church. And yes, I know that there are some of us who are more gifted in evangelism than others, but it doesn't excuse the responsibility we all have share our faith. You want to leave a legacy? Share your faith. Individually and as a church we need to do that. Second thing that just ties in with that is we as a church Supporting evangelism should be our priority. See verse 24, chapter 15 here, Paul says, When I travel to Spain, for I hope to see you when I pass through, and be assisted by you for my journey there. Paul says we need to assist him. That church needs to assist him. We need to assist and make it a priority. Matthew 9 36 and 37. Jesus said, when he saw the crowds, or Matthew wrote, when he saw the crowds, he, Jesus, had compassion for them because they were distressed and dejected like sheep without a shepherd. If that does not describe people today being distressed and dejected like sheep without a shepherd, I'm not sure what does. And Jesus said, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. In all of that, Jesus set the plan in motion for us to reach the nations with the gospel. We are the plan. We are the ones who are going to take his gospel to the nations, to the individuals, to those who are distressed and dejected. And we've got to help one another. Like I mentioned the other day, we're here to build one another up, to encourage one another. Not just for our individual lives, but so that we can reach the nations. Starting right here in Pike County. You may not know, but we got two young ladies. They're going to reach the county through a Bible study for young ladies. We should make that a priority to support them in that. We've got people going to Haiti. We should make it a priority to support them in that. We've got people that have gone to the Philippines and I'm sure want to go back, or not the Philippines, Southeast Asia and the Philippines. We had somebody go to the Philippines. We should support that. And don't hear what I'm not saying. We have. We have supported that. But is it our priority? That's where I want us to think about. Is it our priority? See, we are gathered as individuals, gathering as a family, combining our resources so that we can help one another and spread the gospel. That's one of the nicest things, I think, about um, Southern Baptists is we've got that, that um, cooperative program, which allows us, again, to continue to combine our resources to get greater reach. And even if we ignore that part, what are we doing? Is it, our, is it our priority? We are called to do this, and I think we're called to do this in three different things. We're called to do it financially. We're called to support evangelism financially. See, Paul said, whenever I travel to Spain, he's going to Spain to do a missionary journey, and I hope to see you as I pass through and be assisted. Financially, it's kind of unspoken. He wanted their money to, and their resources to help him get there. 
Because we should be glad to support people who are called by God to go to the ends of the earth. As I was digging into this, I don't know if Paul ever made it to Spain or not. I'm curious, Maddie, as you did your New Testament class, did they ever talk about that? We can talk about that later, but think about that. Aha! Uh -huh. See, they're not sure, because here's the thing. Nowhere in here does it say, Paul reached Spain. But some theologians think that after his first imprisonment, he did go to Spain. And I don't know. I don't know if he did or not. But I do know if he did, the Roman church has assisted. I'm confident of that. See, he was already taking money to support the saints in Jerusalem in verse 26. We read that. So the churches around the area were already supporting him in these efforts to reach others and to help others. And we're, again, over and over, we're called to support evangelism. And it costs money to do that. Those of you who have been on mission trips know it costs money, sometimes a lot of money. And we who are not going should financially assist those who are going. I'm just going to be honest about that. If we're not doing that, shame on us, collectively and individually. Not all of us are going to go to the ends of the earth. The Holy Spirit may only set apart one or two of us to go, as they did with Paul and Barnabas in the church in Antioch. But we should be ready to go, and we should be ready to support financially those who are called to go. It needs to be a priority. It needs to be a financial priority for us individually and for this church collectively. And I'm not saying, please, I'm not saying that we totally ignore the stuff that we've got in our lives and in our families and the things that we're doing here locally. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying we should support financially the evangelism happening locally, the evangelism happening across the nation, the evangelism happening across the world. If we're not supporting that stuff, we need to check ourselves as a church and check ourselves individually. Financially support. Prayerfully support. We need to prayerfully support evangelism. And we see that in verses 30 through 32. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, through our Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in fervent prayers to God on my behalf. Pray that I may be rescued from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my ministry to Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, and that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed together with you. Prayer, 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 prayer. We must be in prayer individually and collectively. The New English Bible, in here where it says, Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, it says, Be allies with me in the fight. The New Living Translation says, join me in my struggle by praying. Join me in the struggle. Join me in the fight. We're called to join in this fight through prayer. Over and over again we see this. Paul's constantly asking for prayers. We've got to pray and make it a priority to pray for evangelism. Colossians 4, 2 through 4. Devote yourselves to prayer. Devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open a door to us for the word, to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains, chains so that I may make it known as I should. Pray for evangelism. Pray for evangelists. Pray for our missionaries locally and around the world. Devote ourselves to prayer. That sounds like a priority to me. In 2 Corinthians 1, 10 through 11, it says, He has delivered us from such a terrible death, and He will deliver us. We have put our hope in Him that He will deliver us again. While you join in helping us by your prayers. 
that many will give thanks on our behalf for the gift that came to us through the prayers of many. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Ephesians 6, 19. There's one more for you. Guess what it's about? Prayer. Pray, pray also for me that the message may be given to me when I open my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. Let me redo this in the New Martin translation. Pray also for evangelists, for missionaries, that the message may be given to them when they open their mouths to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. We are called to pray for those who are sharing the gospel. That means we're called to pray for each other to share the gospel, doesn't it? Locally and around the world. Pray, pray, pray. If you are not praying for our missionaries, please start. There are some people that say that these verses also uh, relate to uh, church leaders. I don't know about that, but I would pray for prayers as well. Pray for Rod and I as we leave the church. But if you're going to choose to pray for something, and it's either me or missionaries, pray for the missionaries. Pray for both, that's even better. But if you're gonna choose one, choose the missionaries. So we're called to um, make it a priority financially and prayerfully. And here's the one that's gonna hurt, because I almost couldn't write this. We've gotta do it all sacrificially. Sacrificially. Paul talks here about praying as allies in the fight. If you're in a fight, it's, there's a sacrifice. There's a struggle, there's a sacrifice. This is more than casual giving or casual praying. This is not just tossing some money in our thankful box. This is not just um, adding um, a missionary at, the, at, at, at your dinner table prayers. This is sacrificially on your knees praying, sacrificially giving to the cause to spread Christ here and around the world. And I know I'm going to butcher this Greek word, but I love it. Uh, again, I've practiced saying it multiple times, I'm going to mess it up. But where he talks about in uh, verse um, 30, to strive together with me in fervent prayers. The Greek word, sunaganizomai. Sunaganizomai. There we go. Sunaganizomai. Maddie's nodding, Maddie's taking Greek. Thank you for confirming that. Um, and even if I get it wrong, it sounds like a great word, doesn't it? Sunaganizomai. <laughs> just uh, agonize. Just uh. I feel like the Hulk in prayer, honestly. And that's what we should do, right? We should really be into it with everything we've got. And we've got an example in our Savior. Because that sunaganismai, the root word, was the same word that they used to describe Jesus when he was praying in the garden. Luke twenty-two forty-four. 44, being in anguish, he prayed more fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. Is that your praying? Is that your giving? Is it like sweat falling like blood? Are you devoting so much of yourself? Are we collectively donating so much of yourselves, of ourselves, to supporting evangelism? Are we doing it sacrificially? And I, in leadership role, must confess that I have not been leading us in prayer sacrificially. So we're going to spend 
as much as I can encourage us to do in church. Spending more time praying for those who are serving as missionaries. Whether it's at our Tuesday, Thursday night prayer gatherings on Zoom, or here, or I would also encourage our women's Bible study and our young ladies' Bible study. Spend time praying for evangelists and missionaries. Jesus said in Luke 21, verses 1 through 4, and it says, He looked up and saw the rich dropping their offerings into the temple treasury, and he also saw a poor widow dropping in two tiny coins. Truly I tell you, Jesus said, this poor widow has put in more than all of them, for all of these people have put in gifts out of their surplus, but she out of her poverty has put in all that she had to live on. Are we giving out of our poverty or out of our blessing and our surplus? I'm not talking financially there, though it's there. Are we agonizing in prayer for the lost? Agonizing, sweat, dropping like blood in prayer for the lost? Are we agonizing in prayer for those who are working with the lost? And the one that hit me hard, are we agonizing in prayer for those who don't have anyone working with them? If you don't have the Unreached People Group app, get it. Today, oh man, another word I'm going to mess up, but the, the Saramacan in Suriname, it's in Brazil, here we go. Unreached People Group of the day. They don't have anybody working with them. What about Afghanistan? Or take one of the unreached people. Are you agonizing in prayer for them? I mean, let's face it, we have a surplus of time. Except for maybe Maddie, who's got a thousand million classes. And, but even she's got a surplus in time. And are we, are we sacrificially giving time to pray? I don't know. I know I need to spend more time agonizing in prayer. We must evangelize here, there, and everywhere. Because here's the deal. I go back to the beginning of Romans, Romans 1, 16, 17, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, just as it is, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. See, without the gospel message, people will die and go to hell. And that should have us on our knees weeping before a king, our creator, and our savior, and our sustainer. Only by his grace have we heard the gospel. People need to know that Christ died for them and rose again. People need to hear that message. And it's got to be, it's got to be our priority, individually and collectively, that we support those who are called to go to the nations, but also that we go ourselves. Locally, wherever we're called. I don't know how many of you have passports. I know this is kind of a weird 
era. If God called you tomorrow to go, to hop on a plane, to fly somewhere, to proclaim his message to the nations, would you be able to? Or would you have to wait a couple of months to get your passport? So that's the one thing that <clears throat> convicted me. And Gina and I had had passports, and I'm like, man, our passports are expired. What if God called us to go somewhere outside the United States? Short term, long term, it didn't matter. What if He called us to go? Could we go? And no. So if you're not prepared, <clears throat> get prepared. Because see, if we're doing our job, if you're called to go and proclaim him to the nations, then we're called to help you. There's a reason that we've written checks to people going on mission trips, because we're called to do that. But my challenge for you is if you're not prepared, start praying and get prepared. Because you don't know what God's going to call you to do. He may never call you to leave Pike County. He may never put an opportunity in there. But man, if he does, I want us individually and collectively prepared to go. Because it's got to be a priority. It's got to be a priority. So as I wrap up, again, my challenge for you today, make it a priority. In your own life, as we make it a priority in this church. Prayerfully, financially, and sacrificially support missionaries and evangelists here, there, and everywhere. And if you're not sharing and not witnessing, start. It's never too late to start. We have, oh, we are so, so blessed right now. See, if, if we were in one of those nations in that 1040 window, we'd have to be really careful about what we were doing here, right? I couldn't go stand on the street corner and proclaim the gospel openly, but I can do that here. And so if you're hiding your faith, stop. Use every method and opportunity you have to proclaim the gospel. Because we have the freedom to do so. Make it a priority in your life. Help us make it, continue to make it, a priority in this church. Let me pray for us. Well, this may be a longer prayer than normal. Father, we just come before you this morning confessing our failure to make witnessing and evangelism a priority in our lives and in this church. Lord, help us, help us, Lord, to make it our priority to make it our priority to share with those around us and to support those who are going to other nations and to other locations. Lord, we lift up that, that unreached people group that I'm not even going to try and pronounce their name again, but you know who they are, Lord. Lord, raise up people to go to them. Raise up people to go to Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq. Southeast Asia, wherever, Lord, raise up people to go there, maybe even from amidst this group. 
Lord, if we are not prepared to go where you call us, Lord, fill the fire in us to get prepared. Lord, you may never call us, but we want to be ready for your call in our lives. Lord, I, I lift up Rod and Mila as they're thinking and planning about possibly returning. Lord, if that's your will, Lord, I, I just ask that you would open all the doors and make that happen. And then, Lord, have us help them. Lord, maybe, again, somebody's called to go somewhere else. Lord, open the doors for them and help us to make that happen. Lord, as we're starting back to school, for those of us who are in school, give us the boldness and the courage and the words to share. Because the people right around us here are just as important as the people outside Outside this nation. So Lord, fill us with the passion to see them saved as well. Lord, help us to make it a priority. Help us to share. To risk all the stuff that Paul did. Because it would mean just one more person maybe would come to know even that's reward enough. That's legacy enough. Lord, help us to have a legacy of proclaiming you individually and as a church. Guide us, Lord. Guide us and use us. It's in your son's precious and holy name.